this week on Core Talk. One of the things that I love about the Corps of Engineers is that the district is made with people from the area. So we are in this together. We are committed to that mission. We are partners to get the projects delivered. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties, all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the You Safe Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. SAIs. 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 Let us try. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of Core Talk. I'm James Walker. And I'm Major Tony Funkhauser. And today we bring you a very special episode. We're going, this is going to be a little bit different. Sir, do you want to go ahead and give the explanation for this, what we're doing today? Yeah, it's just a little bit. Uh, one, I just want to say today I hit one year in the district. So it's been a lot of learning for me, a lot of growing, a lot of meeting all the great people in the organization. Um, so it's been a really, really fun year for me. Um, we've been working a lot through projects with our Milcon. We've been hanging out at Langley Eustis a lot. We went out to um, focus on Arlington National Cemetery. Our civil works programs are continuing to grow and develop. CSRMs are just constantly um, progressing forward. We just had a great success with Miami-Dade County CSRM project. So we're working on getting that final chief, chief's report. Um, and then our emergency management, we're prepping for hurricane season. Right. Um, so that's a big focus for our team right now. We know this is a La Nina um, season this year. So there's a lot of opportunity for potential uh, disasters. So that's really what we're kind of focusing on in the district this year and as we move into uh, fiscal year 25. And in the last year, there have been a lot of relationships built, a lot, as you said, a lot of movement and a lot of change. Throughout this past season of Core Talk, we've had the opportunity to talk to some of our 40-year Norfolk District veterans yep. and some of the engineering professionals and other than engineering professionals, which have been here for less than five years, but have still have a very significant impact. Now, we are looking at some more change as we move into the rest of this year. We are having a change of command. I know that there was something specific that you wanted to explain about yeah, changes yeah. of command in the core versus elsewhere. Yes. Yeah, it's a, uh, there's a little bit of different nuances. Uh, what I would say is we've uh, we've spent the last three weeks going through a transition phase of prepping the new commander that's onboarding right now. Um, we we essentially put three months worth of partnerships and relationships and engagements into a three-week process just to help uh, support the transition. Um, and change commands are really that, tr that transfer of authority in a formal setting that allows us to know that the new individual is taking command. So normally on a parade field for an Army unit, we'd be marching around and doing the more traditional stuff. I know this is not your first change command that you've witnessed. No, not at all. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different, a so little unique that we have, you know, a lot of civilian employees, we're having a lot of them participate in the ceremony. So it's just right. a, an opportunity for them to see the new commander. And we're going to be welcoming in our 61st commander to the Norfolk District. So change is a very interesting topic. Uh, at least from my experience, I know that a lot of people, or well, some people, tend to be a little change averse, while others tend to embrace the opportunity for change. Personally, for a long time, I've tended to tear back and forth in regards to what concept I maintained in my mind, what understanding I had as to what change is and its significance for me personally and, and for those around me. To start off kind of explaining this, I want to share a photo with you guys, if you guys will, uh, don't mind. <laughs> Take a look at that. Okay. And so you, do you see this? Oh, I do. Yeah. What do you think that is? It's a tree. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't make that. I should have made that harder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is a tree. What kind of tree do you think it is? Sir, you have a guess? I don't. I have. This is a, actually a redwood. It's a, it's a sequoia tree. Oh, okay. But it's been bonsai. This, this is a like almost a 30-year-old bonsai of a sequoia tree. Now, if you look here, 
this is my wife in California next to a sequoia tree that's a couple thousand years old and hundreds of feet high. Now, what this is the reason why I like the topic of change, because if you were to take one of these seeds from the cone, for example, that may be produced, let, let's imagine for a second that both trees came from the same cone. If you were to analyze the DNA of this cone, you would see that there is absolutely no difference. However, the end state, this, this pro, these two, one tree is, is hundreds of feet high or hundreds of feet tall, and the other one can sit on a desk in your house, you see two different things. So, well, for a very long time, I've had this idea that none of us really ever change. We just manifest our inherent potential to some degree or, or another over time. But then, and there is also the idea, you know, some people will say that you never meet the same person twice, not even in the same body, right? That's because the things, the reason why you do what you do today is not the reason why you did it 20 years ago, and it's not the reason why you're going to do similar things or different things 20 years from now. Another way of looking at it is that, you know, the values that we maintain, the motivations that we have, the our intentions, the missions that we have could kind of reflect that aspect of ourselves that is kind of pin, hard to pinpoint because we can't look ourselves in the eye. We, can't, we can kind of see what we're doing in the environment and measure that, but it's kind of hard to sometimes define ourselves. So what actually is changing? I'm proposing this question to you just to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we move forward in this discussion, because what change means for an individual, you would think that it would somehow translate for us as, as an organization as well, as a conglomerate of individuals. When we're looking at change as an organization, when we're looking at change as a community, as a commonwealth, what does that mean and what is its significance? We've had some people since our last town hall engage us and provide some questions for us, sir, um, knowing that we were going to talk to you on this podcast. So we tried our best to, to weave these questions into our discussion. So if you guys don't mind, you guys want to just dive right in? Let's go. All Let's right. Let's do it. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Colonel Sonny Avichol? Who is Sonny Avichol? Is there a difference? Okay, that, that's a really uh, deep question right off the bat. Um, but, but it's a good one, right? So, um, and, and the longer I've been in the military, the longer I've tried to realize or, or, or tried to come up with, really it's, it's one person um, trying to be authentic, trying to understand how you live in your personal life and translate that into your work life, um, that becomes your authentic self. And that's kind of when you want to get to authentic leadership. And there are some people that really it comes very naturally, and there are others where you have to work at it. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with Sonny Avichal, the, the person. Um, so originally I'm uh, born in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, I'm the youngest of three siblings. Uh, my parents were actually immigrants from India. Um, uh, we, so we were, we were raised essentially, they were first generation, I'm second generation immigrants from India. Um, in India, they, they grew up really poor. Uh, they are really the, the American dream story that you hear about. Uh, <clears throat> they, they started off with, you know, $50 if even in their pockets and wow. uh, they were able to, to come here and make a, a, a good living for myself and my siblings. Um, <clears throat> I'm married uh, 13 years to my wife, Orvi. She, like me, is also first or second generation Indian, uh, Indian American. Uh, her parents, oddly enough, uh, in India, uh, we didn't know this at the time, but uh, our families were only about 20 miles apart from each other. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> which <laughs> was really strange. Uh, and, and so when, when we first met, we would, uh, <clears throat> we're just kind of talking about where our parents are from. So we knew generally uh, where everybody was from. But then when our parents met, that's when they realized, oh, you're from this town? Well, we're from this town, which were like kind of neighbors with each other and uh, it's really kind of like a very small, small world. Um, I have uh, two children, two boys, Arjun and Dev. Uh, my Arjun is uh, turning 12, or he just turned 12 uh, last week, 
and then uh, Dev is 10 years old. Good age. Yep. And so, uh, <clears throat> I mean, about myself, uh, 22 years in the military, um, first one in my family to join the military. Uh, so I don't really have, you know, a lot of people have lineage, and that I don't. I am the lineage. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's been an incredible career so far. Most recently, I moved from Germany. Uh, that was about a month ago, still waiting on one car to show up. And uh, that's it. That's, that's pretty much it. What kind of hobbies do you have, sir? I play tennis, tennis. and occasionally pickleball. Uh-oh. We're, we're gonna be. We might become <laughs> rivals, sir. I don't know if we will, but I'll, I'll make you my teammate if you want. <laughs> but I know you have some good history or some good stories from when you played tennis as a child. I, I do. I have a few. Um, so, when I was a uh, when I was really young, we used to live really close to tennis courts in Atlantic City, and so my dad he used to play uh, recreationally, and then I used to go with him, and we used to hit against a, a wall. Right, and that's how I learned. Uh, I was about five years old when I started. And then I just kept playing and playing and playing. And next thing you know, I'm 12 years old and uh, I'm competing in these tournaments. And all of a sudden they're like, hey, you're, you're, you're pretty good. We, you really could move to Florida because that's like the mecca of uh, tennis. And that's where the hub of uh, all the really good tennis players would, would train. And so, uh, I moved to Florida, actually attended a tennis academy, played with um, some of the, the pros right now. So the Williams sisters played with them, uh, played with Andy Roddick, um, and some, wow. some really extraordinary, extraordinary people. They've, they've of course, gone on. <laughs> uh, That's but, pretty cool, though. But, no, they, it, it, was, it was pretty uh, pretty neat childhood to have. Um but yeah, that, that was that was it. But I, I played all through college and uh, play every once in a while now. I have a question, if you don't mind. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and we're 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 discussing how we see our children, how we raise them. Me, for example, when I became an adult and I had kids, I had like this list of things that I wanted to do differently from from my parents. I. I I wanted to do it my own way because I thought that I knew better. And trying to give my kids everything that I thought that I had deserved that I didn't get, kind of, I think that I, I kind of uh, created a situation that was less than advantageous for them. I, the, they could have benefited from some of those perceived hardships that I had when I was a kid, right? Now, your parents the values that they transmitted to you, what they must have been, and how that has become something useful to you in your life. What do you think would be the most valuable but also different than most, maybe some, your average person that you'd run past on the street may not have experienced? My dad, uh, he, he passed two years ago, but um, he was always a huge believer in just hard work. Like, you need to work and you need to outwork everybody else that was because that's what he ended up that's how he had to live his life mm -hmm. um, especially being an immigrant and he they immigrated here 1970 to new york and so they they started off very small my dad was a security guard he was 140 pounds in a, as a security guard oh, wow. so <laughs> in new york city so uh he learned just to hustle and to work hard and, uh, you know, eventually it kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, so that was what he instilled in me. And I remember as a kid, even though I didn't have to, I wasn't a security guard or we had a lot more than when he had originally shown up, um, he always stressed to me, like, hard work, study hard. Even when I came to sports, give it your best all the time. And so with my kids, um, that's really been instilled in me, and so it's funny. My wife, every time they leave, go out the door, she, her first words out of her mouth are, hey, be kind. Hmm. Because she is uh, a huge believer, and so am I, um, that kindness is, is extremely important, especially as kids are young. Um, and we want to instill that in them. Like, if you remember nothing else, you need to be a kind person to, to those around you. 
Um, and then I usually follow up, uh, but work hard. Uh, and so those are kind of the two values I would say that we instill. Um, kind of the, not the yin and the yang, but uh, just from two different perspectives. Um, but I am glad and I'm really proud of my kids. They're, they're very kind kids that work hard. So um, hopefully you'll get to see them sometime. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, they're, they're, one, that you got two great kids, and or- Orvi's awesome. It was uh, great interacting with you guys at the 4th of July uh, fireworks show here, which is, was great. And you, you highlight two great values um, that, that you're incorporating in your kids. What kind of principles and values are you incorporating into your command philosophy? And then are those the same kind of principles and values, which I think they are, but I'm not going to answer the question for you, that, that drive and guide you um, as a leader? Yep, so I, I think be kind translates into different things as, as you get older. But, yep. um, I mean, I think first and foremost, dignity and respect, right? You have to start with that baseline level with all of your interactions with everybody that you're around. Um, going beyond that when in terms of leadership, I thought my personal leadership style is one where I really like to get to know those that I'm leading. I like to have a relationship, uh, understand them on a personal level as well as a professional level. Um, That just helps me understand where they're coming from and then ways in which I can better be their leader. Um, And so I don't approach every single person as the same. I think every person is different, different backgrounds. And so the more I'm able to understand where they're coming from, uh, the better I feel like I can serve them as a leader. Um, Coming to the Corps of Engineers is a very different experience because most often we come into the room, especially as military leaders, and we are the least experienced person in the room when it comes to whatever the topic is. So um, I've learned humility. Coming in, uh, humility and being able to listen is probably one of the biggest skills um, that I will continue to take with me as as we transition into this command. Um, And then finally, once you've learned and you have some basis of understanding, uh, communicating and trying to create a shared vision. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has something to give. So being inclusive and then understanding where everybody fits in the big picture, I think is, is really an important thing uh, that I'd like to bring to the command. I know we talked a little bit about it. It's, it's the, the changing dynamics as leaders within the organizations that we're working within. So being able to change and adjust to the environment, which is exactly what you're highlighting. Um, I know you're just coming from another Army assignment. Before that, you were with the Nashville District and the New England District as a deputy. So you, you do have an understanding of the Corps of Engineers environment, which is much different than me my first time jumping in here and I'm trying to adjust, which took me a little bit of time. So it's it's good to know that you've already kind of seen that experience once so that it should be, you know, just sliding right in back into the district. Mm-hmm. That picture I showed you of the sequoia that had been bonsai pruned and guided, pretty much adapting and growing around these changes in the environment you know, so an upward trajectory, trying to get somewhere, you have to adapt these perspectives that when you talk about diversity, a perspective that comes with a cultural difference, an age difference, a general experience difference, those things, when we integrate them, we find our our trajectory shifting and probably becoming a little bit more accurate time and time again. That's what it sounded like you were saying. Okay, sir, over the last month or so, you've been um, experiencing all of our projects and programs in the Norfolk District. I know it's a little bit different than um, than what you're working on in Nashville. You know, they, they always say, once you've seen one district, you've seen one district. So we're, we're trying to rapidly build you into the program of the Norfolk District. What are, um, and I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the questions that came from our, our uh, employees. Yes. So we'll make sure that we get the, the answer on tape for you. <laughs> um, but wh- where do you see opportunities for growth, what were some of the challenges that you saw that potentially we could improve or make ourselves a better organization? Um, what are some of the initial goals and initiatives that you have in mind for the district um, that we want to continue to support or what you want to continue to support? 
Initially, I, I don't have an opinion, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say I don't have an opinion. But I don't have a judgment. Um, and really for the first 90 days, I'm going to be an open book of just learning how the organization does business, our partnerships, how we hire folks, our people, um, and our processes how we execute our mission on a daily basis. And I think it's really important not to judge early on because, like you said it, Tony, one district, just because you've seen it done differently somewhere else, doesn't mean that that fits for here. And, yes, if, if having some core experience is – it does help, especially getting me up to speed – uh, with the projects, but at the same time, it, I'm 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 holding uh, any sort of judgment or anything like that until I really understand why we do the things we do in the district and uh, what is working and what's not. And I think really, again, I'll, I'll call it like my campaign for learning. So really, 90 days. I will. That's that's the whole purpose. Um, I know I have a lot of deep dives. Uh, these are like hour-long meetings uh, where I'm going to learn about uh, some of the programs, some of the policies that we have already within the district. But on the other end, I mean, I, I, I am completely open to any sort of feedback. So I know we have a commander's uh, inbox. So if anybody wants to submit some feedback uh, anonymously or say your name, um, I am really just, just open to learning the organization as much as possible. Um, when I look at the organization, one of the things that I really need to or I'm going to prioritize is, is learning the people. Uh, and it's a lot m more challenging now than it was maybe a few years ago. So it's a hybrid environment now. Right. So that, that does pose a little bit of a challenge, but I will probably be out wandering the hallway finding random people. Uh, I'll probably eat my lunch downstairs in the cafeteria or in the, in the uh, central room just because the, the more people you know, the better. Uh, you can just understand an organization. So that's kind of my thoughts going in uh, for the next 90 days or so. As you were just explaining, there's a lot of diversity as far as the projects that the district is involved with or involved in, rather. You've got Gathright Dam, you've got the various CSRM projects, you've got an environmental restoration projects, the All National Cemetery, Southern Expansion Project as well. And as you were saying at the beginning, we're about to run into hurricane season. So there's the... With the crisis action team, yeah. Crisis action team. Mm -hmm. As you've gone around and as you've spoken to people, is there any particular project or aspect about our community even, the community that, that, we, that we service, that you find to be particularly interesting or that you're excited about as you're coming on board? The mission of Arlington National Cemetery is something that, uh, even if you're not in the Corps of Engineers, is something anybody that wears a uniform, I mean, that's, that's of national significance. That has a special place for all of us that have lived through the military, especially the last 20 years. So um, that, from just a um, pride standpoint, is, is extremely important to me right off the bat. Um, a lot of our planning studies are ones that, I'll, I'll give you a little background. Um, I've never dealt with planning studies before. So that is a weakness, and that's something where I will concentrate on a lot, uh, just understanding the process and understanding all of the wickets that, that we need to go to to essentially get through a planning study. Um, that's going to be a little bit accelerated because, as Tony mentioned, we have a chief's report coming up, and I think I have to brief General Graham in about 30 to 60 days on that chief's report. So uh, that will be uh, uh, something that I'll, I'll dive into right off the bat. But, no, I mean, I, I, those are probably the two things that are probably biggest on my radar coming up. Um, Apart from that, it's it's a really diverse program, really exciting. Um, so I'm I'm 
I just can't wait to kind of get started. Yeah, and I know, sir, I know we've talked about and that we've got a very diverse program here, a lot of stuff that you're going to have your attention on. Um, I know CSRMs are going to be a large focus. But, at, you know, over the, the podcast that we've done over this season, we've um, had the opportunity to meet great people on this team. So whether they're 40-year veterans um, that have recently retired, that have been in the civil works world for, you know, they, they started a lot of the meetings that we are now attending, you know, 30 years later, um, which was a great conversation. Um, we met a lot of rising superstars that are very young in this organization, that are very hungry, and they're doing a lot of great work to support CSRM projects, so they're doing a lot of great work to support some of our environmental uh, surveys and, you know, all these other things. We've got a lot of great PMs, a lot of great folks focusing on the construction projects. Right. As the senior leader of the district now, um, and I know you've been leading engineers for quite some time now, what are some of your thoughts on the professionals that you've met within this thir first 30 to 45 days with the programs that we're currently supporting? World class. They seriously are experts. They know their business inside and out. And um, they have a true commitment to getting the job done. There's an urgency when I talk to them about getting these projects delivered. And so I'm just excited to, to help them in any way that I can to execute what they're already doing. So circling back really quickly to the topic of change and given everything that we've discussed so far, do you have any words that you would like to maybe share um, with our stakeholders and the community um, as you take the reins and come on board, sir? So one of the things that I love about the Corps of Engineers, and Tony and I were talking about this earlier today, is that the district is made up with people from the area. We are in the community with our stakeholders. We grew up, we go to the high schools, or a lot of the majority of our employees have grown up in this area. So we are committed to that mission. I'm committed to helping deliver those projects to our stakeholders and partners. We are in this together, and I see our role as partners, not just, we're not executors, we are partners to get the projects delivered. And that being said, is there any particular message you would like to share with our team um, for consideration as we move forward as well? So a lot of this goes back to what I've seen over the last 30 days, and, and even before this. Uh, actually, even when I was selecting which districts I wanted to be able to go to, the Norfolk District has a reputation amongst the Corps as being one of the best. And I'm not just saying that. It, it truly does have a great reputation. We were with a stakeholder earlier this week, and they, they work with multiple districts, and they told us the exact same thing. Uh, this organization has a great reputation. My goal in whatever it is that I do in the district is to keep that reputation and to build on that reputation wherever I can. And so uh, if there are ways that I can help that people know about, please let me know. But uh, that is something that I feel is entrusted in the commander is to maintain and hold that reputation uh, with our higher headquarters as well as uh, with our people. So I have to ask, going back to the beginning, what I was what I was saying about change, what, what is your opinion on that? So, like, is it our inherent action potential as people and an organization? Is that what is that who we are and what is changing due time? Or is it the values that guide us and our goals and our mission that is actually working as who we are and evolving through time as well? Or is it both? Is it, is it depending, is it a macro versus micro focus? Is, 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 are both of them correct? What, what is your opinion? I believe that we're always changing as individuals. And I think it's our experiences that shape us into who we are, but then it could be the next experience that happens that shapes us in a different direction. I think that's healthy. That's how we should all, because we're constantly learning 
I think when you become too inflexible, when you become too rigid in who you are, uh, then you are unopen to that change. And I don't think that that's healthy. So to go back to your question, for me, I'm always changing. And I think that that's, that's good. I'm open to feedback and open to new experiences. Semper Gumby. <laughs> Semper Gumby. <laughs> Something that I just want to know, I know that there's always angst with change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like there's uncertainty, there's a new personality, new military background, new skills, abilities, things that you're bringing to the table. We don't need to be scared. The district is going to be great. We're still going to be great because we're relying on our team and we're filled with all these world-class professionals um, that are here supporting the district. And now we're bringing in Colonel Sonny Avichal. Like one thing that my dad taught me when I was a young lieutenant, always improve your foxhole. So literally and figuratively. So yes, you can have the perfect foxhole, but you can always make it better. And I think that's what we're doing here today is we're making our district better every single day. I think it goes back to our 1% uh, conversation that we had. Like if we get 1% better every day, over 365 days, we're exponentially better as a team. And what I find particularly heartening is, you know, we, we always say, people first yep and and sir one of the things that you said is that you know coming coming in the door your focus is getting to know the people mm-hmm. and and that's that says everything right there yeah yeah so again sir thank you for taking yep. the time and, thank you and, and welcome <laughs> thank you and uh really to, to to everybody this has just been an extraordinary four weeks that we've been here um i know it's not easy when you have a new commander Uh, I know it's not easy to put on a change of command ceremony or to show me around to the different project sites, but uh, my hat's off to the Norfolk team. You've opened uh, your arms. I feel extremely, extremely welcome, and uh, I'm excited to uh, take command and uh, lead the district in the future. Thank you, sir, for being on. Thanks for tuning in to the Core Talk podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe if you've enjoyed this conversation and found the information to be interesting or useful. Your feedback matters. Remember to comment with any ideas or questions you may have regarding U.S. Army Corps of Engineers projects within your community. Episodes come out the first Wednesday of every month. Until next time.